This is the Money Seed Podcast, where we discuss all things investing, plain and simple, the way it should be. Please remember, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to be investment advice. Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. I'm very happy to have Tan Pham from AsianEfficiency.com. Tan has been CEO and founder of AsianEfficiency.com for about 11 years now. And AsianEfficiency.com provides all kinds of coaching, mentoring, and other kind of programs on productivity and realizing your full potential. And besides all that, Tan also runs a very successful podcast called The Productivity Show, which I believe has over 12 million downloads to date on, on iTunes, which is absolutely phenomenal. And yeah, Tan, I look forward to talking to you about uh, your amazing story. Thanks, Gabe, for having me uh, on your show today. And uh, yeah, excited to chat with you here and share anything that could uh, benefit the listener here today. Excellent. So the first thing that caught my eye when I heard your story is that you called your company Asian Efficiency. How did that come about? It's a very strange name. Yeah. So when I was working in uh, corporate America, late 2000s, um, I was the only Asian person in the company. I worked on a relatively small company. It was maybe 20 people or so. Uh, I was the only Asian person. I was also the youngest person in the company. And uh, I was also uh, somebody who was always had a strong work ethic. So I would work very hard. And uh, my formula for success was just work hard, work long, whatever needs to be done, just do it. Don't complain, just do it. And so people started to notice around me how I was getting stuff done. I wasn't necessarily efficient or very productive. I was just working really hard. And uh, as I was just working on my projects and the things that were assigned to me, I was just going and crushing my to-do list all the time. And uh, people started to notice it and they go, oh, Tan, how do you accomplish all these different things? That's uh, some crazy Asian efficiency. And then uh, that was a coworker of mine who said that. And I thought, oh, that's so funny. Uh, I'm going to have to register that domain name because uh, here, at least in the United States, there's this positive stereotype of the fact that Asian people are very efficient people. Uh, and that was not a thing like growing up in the Netherlands, but it's, it is here. And so I thought, oh, this is so funny. Like, I'm just going to register this domain name. And this is at a time when I was like always registering domain names for things that I found interesting because who knows, one day that could be flipped into, you know, a million dollar sale uh, for someone who is interested. Uh, but then, you know, a year later, I said, you know what, uh, I need to do something with this domain name. And I started a blog where I just want to share information about things I've learned about productivity as I was studying productivity, time management, efficiency, and so on. And it was just started starting off as a passion project, partly as a joke, because it was just, you know, I thought it was a funny name. Uh, little did I know, did it accidentally turn into a, a successful business that it is today. And I mean, I guess in, in, I guess in this politically correct climate did, does anyone ever reach out to you and say hey tan you know you should uh you should change the name of that company it's uh it's an incorrect stereotype or a maybe inappropriate stereotype yeah there was actually a uh, lawsuit a few years ago not directly against me but there was a lawsuit where my company was actually being cited as an example where uh there was a band name who had like uh what some people might consider an insensitive or insensitive name and it was kind of like racially toned and I uh, had a little bit of an Asian spin to it. And so my company name was somehow mentioned in the lawsuit as an example of, you know, a, a good or bad example of what a company name should look like. And so uh, eventually the lawsuit got dropped and, you know, the band name could could have stayed. And from my point of view, it wasn't really that bad at all. Um, but uh, it was just funny that some people observe it in such a way. And I've had many people say, hey, Tan, you should totally consider changing your names uh, to something else that's maybe corporate friendly or anything like that. Like, just like there's a company called, and here in Texas called Big Ass Fans. Uh, and guess what they make? They make really big fans. <laughs> and so they've never changed their name, even though it's kind of you know funny and catchy and a little, maybe even a little inappropriate, but it's a huge business. And uh, that kind of gave me the confidence and success to say, hey, you know what? I am not going to change my name. Uh, I'm also the founder of the company behind it. I intend to do this for the rest of my life. This is my passion project. This is like my legacy. Uh, if you want to work with me, you're going to have to roll with it. Um, but if you're if this doesn't resonate with you, 
that's fine too. But what's funny is most of my clients, I would say 90% of my clients are actually Caucasian. So it, it has nothing to do with the name whatsoever. Uh, it's just a funnier stereotype and, and people remember it because it's uh, catchy. And that's what I was going to say is don't change it, right? Don't change it because like you said, it's super catchy, easy to remember. Like, I don't think I'll ever forget the website called asianefficiency.com. And now you have brand recognition. You've been around for 11 years, but let's quickly go back to in your early 20s. So you're in your early 20s, you're working in corporate America, you register the domain name. A year later, you start your blog. How did the blog grow? And at what point did you realize, hey, wait a minute, I can do this full time? Yeah, so I I dropped out of college to work for this company, this corporate company. And uh, that was kind of like cardinal sin number one of any Asian kid is dropping out of school. And so my parents weren't very happy when I did that. Uh, but the problem was when I dropped out of school, because I was a foreign student and international student, I had to stay enrolled to keep my visa. But because I dropped out, uh, I got a letter one day saying, hey, Tian, seem, doesn't seem like you're enrolled in school right now. That means your visa is invalid. You will have to leave the country in the next 30 days. And I go, oops, okay, uh, let's let's figure out and do this then. So I had to quit my company uh, that I worked for. And I didn't want to go back home to the Netherlands where my parents were because I was so ashamed that I dropped out of school and had nothing to show for it because now I had to leave the United States, which was my dream and my parents' dream as well. So I ended up in Thailand uh, staying with a friend. And I said, you know what? I have so much free time right now. I'm living off my savings. Um, and blogging was like the hot thing back then. This is like 2009, 2010. And so I said, you know what? I'm just going to start a blog. And so I started a blog, asianefficiency.com, where I would just dedicate one piece of content every single week. And I would just write about all the things I've learned about productivity, because that's something I was passionate about. I studied it quite a bit. Having been unproductive to now being productive, I said, there's a lot of uh, wisdom here that I think a lot of people would value. And if I just create content around it, hopefully people will like it and, and share it. And so originally it just started off as a friends and family thing because a lot of friends of my family members would oftentimes just uh, email me and say, hey, Tana, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you use a to-do list? What calendar app do you use? And there would always be the same questions. And I go, you know what? So instead of answering the same question again, I'm going to write a blog post and then point people to it. So that's originally how it started. And uh, maybe six, eight months later on, uh, it kind of caught wind of different editors on different websites. So at one point, like Lifehacker, New York Times, started linking to it and it started to explode. And then people start coming with more emails saying, hey, Tan, I really love your stuff. Like, can I hire you for coaching, consulting? Do you have workshops? And I go, oh, no, no, no. This is all for free. This is just a passion project. I'm not here to make money. But I kept getting those emails. And then one day... Uh, I said, oh, maybe I could turn this into a business. So at this point, I already moved to Budapest, Hungary. And uh, I had to work uh, at the startup because I was running out of money. And I heard through a friend of a friend that someone started a company there and they were hiring people. And I uh, would qualify because I had certain skill sets that you know they found valuable. Uh, it was an SEO agency and I had a little bit of marketing experience. And so I said, you know what? Well, I'll, I'll just go because I need, I need a job. I'm running out of funds. Uh, and while I'm still building Asian efficiency as a blog, uh, hopefully this will support me in the meantime. And so I had a daytime job there for about a year. And every night when I came home from work, I would work on my passion project, you know, write another blog post, things I learned at work and so on. And so uh, it wasn't until like about 10 months in when I said, okay, let's actually turn this into a business. So I launched my first course, teaching people how to sleep better because sleep is so important for productivity. But I made a really crucial mistake, which was um, I did the research on what people needed. Like I was trying to solve a problem, which is really what business is about. You're trying to solve a problem. But I wasn't surveying my own audience. So I had a huge reader base, but I wasn't interviewing them or surveying them. I was re reviewing materials on the internet of people who weren't reading my stuff. And there was a lot of problems around sleep. And I knew how important sleep was that, oh yeah, let's create a sleep product because there's so many people who need it. And then when I launched it against my own audience, nobody bought it. It was like crickets when I launched it. And I said, oh my gosh, like this is my first product. Uh, if if this didn't work, like, you know, I'm, I'm never going to turn this into a business, even though all these people asked me for help. And so I learned about this idea of what uh, some people call the lean startup idea, which is all about 
instead of creating a product and then launching it, hoping that it's going to work, which is what a lot of people do, what you should do is create the product with your prospects and iterate from there. And you're creating the solution with them. So you're kind of like beta testing it before you launch it. And then uh, when you have the final product, you already know that it works because you've worked with so many different people on it. So by the time you launch it, you'll know that it will be a success. So it's not a hope strategy anymore. And so I did that with one of my courses on crushing your to-do list and that just you know blew it out of the water. And uh, from that moment on, I was able to go full-time. And Tan, when you mentioned this course, was it like an online course where you just had videos and people paid to watch the video or was it more live or one-on-one -on -one type training? Yeah, so this was back in 2012. So live training was not that prevalent at that time. So it was really about, I rec recorded a bunch of videos of step-by-step -step how to do something. And I recorded ahead of time everything that you would need it to know. And then I would sell it as an online course. So people would buy access to it and then be able to go through it uh, at their own pace and then have support with me, uh, if, whether it's email or sometimes I would do a live call and then be there for questions and answers. So it was a relatively simple thing. And this is also when online courses kind of just started around 2011, 2012, when it became a thing. Uh, but nowadays, most of our courses are actually live. So where we have live interactive sessions with people. Definitely, because the, the photos on your website definitely show you in front of a live audience. But I guess back in, so back in like, I guess this must have been 2012, 2013 timeframe, roughly when you're launching your first video course, did you go through a, a hosting provider like Udemy or Skillshare, or did you do it all on your own hosting everything? Yeah. So this is back when the technology stack wasn't that great yet, right? It's just like how you and I, uh, back in the day, we had floppy disk and, you know, we had to dial and, you know, that's how we make phone calls. And nowadays we can just press a bunch of buttons and everything just works. So technology gets better every single year, but back then it was pretty archaic. So it was literally just like, uh, I, I was very fortunate that I learned how to code early on when I was younger. I taught myself how to code when I was like nine years old. And uh, I'd learned like PHP, like I learned my SQL. So I learned like the basics of web programming. And so when I was building out this online course, like the there was no learning management system or LMS where you're hosting courses online, which is something like, like something like Udemy is or any of those online course platforms. So none of that existed at that point. So I had to like kind of like you know, make my own version of it a little bit to use other people's software and then update it and code it. And it was all me. It was all me. So technology is a lot better nowadays. It's much easier now for people to create courses and upload them and have a platform. But back then I had to kind of like duct tape different things together to, to make it work, but it all worked out. So back then it was just you. So you did everything from website design to record the videos, post the video. It was like, it was just a one person operation. Yeah. Like most entrepreneurs, you, you, you start off wearing many different hats, right? You have to do all the dirty work, uh, the the fun stuff, but also the stuff that you don't like to do at all. Uh, and I had to learn on on the go. And that's one of the things I value about entrepreneurship is you literally learn as you go. And that's still going on today. And as markets are changing, marketing is changing and technology is changing. I'm always learning as we go as well. And so, yeah, in the beginning, I had to do everything. And there were a lot of times where I was stuck. You know, I had to post something on the forum <laughs> or would ask other friends who maybe had something similar and go, oh, hey, how do you do this? Or do you know somebody who can do this? And that's one valuable lesson I learned in entrepreneurship too is oftentimes when you have a problem, it's mostly a who problem. Like it's not about how you can do this or what you need to do, but who can do this for you. And if you have the resources to be able to hire people, uh, oftentimes any problem you have is already figured out by someone else because someone else is usually already an expert in something. So if I have a problem nowadays, it's not me trying to fi figure it out. It's me more trying to figure out like who can do this to solve this problem for me, ideally, or do it for uh, my client base. And so that's a, that's a big lesson I had to learn over the last few years. And you are 11 years in now. How big is your team today? Uh, so our team is 15 people today. And uh, again, just started with you know one person and grew naturally to 15. And uh, people are all, are all over the world. So we've always been remote since day one. And so when the pandemic came, I was like, oh, welcome to my world. This is how we do things uh, already. <laughs> and it was just an easy transition when that happens. But uh, we have people in the United States, Canada, and Asia, and Europe, uh, and also in Australia. So we have different time zones, but we try to meet once a day uh, during our daily huddle where we'll all come together and kind of share and uh, help 
help each other out and unblock things. Um, but yeah, we've always been remote and something that I really value. And I had to learn like a lot of remote work best practices through trial and error, which I'm now very fortunate to be able to teach to other companies and organizations who are now transitioning towards remote. I love it. So the, your experiences of running a remote team all of a sudden became a valuable skill set <laughs> about two years ago when we all went into lockdown for sure. Yeah. So, so I guess delegation is a big part of productivity and getting things done. How do you delegate? How do you decide who who in your team of 15 does what and how did it become a team of 15? So when it comes to delegation, uh, there's like different steps you can take to get to uh, the ultimate prize, which is someone does all the work that you don't do anymore. So I always recommend before you delegate something, do it yourself first, especially if it's a really important process. It's good to be able to know how it works doing doing it yourself so that when you delegate it, you know, one, who to delegate it to, but also two, you can assess their quality of work as well. And sometimes we are in a position where we can't do the work ourselves. So for example, you know, if the pipes broke down at my home, uh, I could do it myself and I could try to learn it, but I honestly don't have the skills and the desire to learn. So I would rather hire somebody to do that for me, right? But if, for example, when we started our podcast five years ago, um, I did the editing myself initially. So I kind of learned how to edit. And because I edited the first bunch of podcasts, I noticed, oh, I say, um, quite a bit. And so that's something I realized. And I said, if I delegated that from day one, I would have never had that insight because my editor would just, you know, edit that out and I would always look polished, but I actually wouldn't be polished. And so there's a lot of benefits to doing stuff yourself first, learning the ropes. And sometimes we have to do things that aren't scalable, but as long as we know the process, then we're much more capable to be able to delegate something because then we can see if someone actually does a good job or not, but also delegate it to the right person. Because if something is very technical, we don't want to delegate something to somebody who's not technical whatsoever. It's, it sounds so simple as an, as a concept, but what, and the mistake that I see most people make when it comes to delegating is they either delegate it to the wrong person or when they delegate it, it's very much incomplete. So one thing I always want to make sure uh, people do is when they delegate something, always write, what is the definition of done, the DOD? Because if I outsource or delegate a logo design, right, I might say, hey, I want a beautiful logo. That's kind of abstract. And uh, when I give that to your creator, it's very difficult to say, what's the definition of success here or definition of done, right? However, if I told a person, I want to have a logo that represents Asian efficiency in the colors orange and gray, and I want to deliver it in a JPEG format, you know, 500 pixels by 500 in my Dropbox folder uh, by Friday at noon. Now we are a lot more specific, and we can still have back and forth with the with the designer, but at least we know that one, there's a deadline. We have the specifications laid out and any resources this person might need, for example, access to my Dropbox or login information or, you know, specific color codes that they might need. Like these are all things I could provide up front or we at least talk about it. Uh, but at least we have some sort of outcome that we're working towards together. So whenever you're delegating something, always make sure you have a very specific definition of done so that both parties know what success ultimately, ultimately looks like. Because the moment you get something back and you go, oh, this is not what I wanted whatsoever. I told you something completely differently. That's when you know you didn't have a clear definition of done. So uh, whenever you're in that situation, just try to refine your definition of done and you'll get a lot better at it over time. It takes a little bit of practice, but everyone can do it. I think that's excellent advice. And I think it goes both ways, right? Because if you don't define your DOD clearly, the person who is doing that task, may, you know, they may think they're doing a great job and they're giving you exactly what you need. And then all of a sudden you tell them, no, this is not what I want and I'm not happy. Then all of a sudden you might, you know, they might not be all that happy with you. So it's probably good to get ahead of that and to set expectations up front. I agree. Yeah. And one thing I always recommend for first timers or people who are new to delegating is as soon as you've delegated something to somebody, have them repeat it back to you. So whenever I talk to somebody and I delegate something, especially if it's somebody I've never worked with, uh, I will say my vision, you know, here's what I would like to accomplish. Here's my definition of done. Here are the resources you might need. Can you repeat back to me what we are trying to accomplish? And then they'll say it back and they go, oh, do you want 
you know, this and that. And I go, no, 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 I want actually this and that. So we're actually preventing a lot of like mistakes already by having the other person repeat back. So that's a, a pro tip I recommend for those who are new. Sounds good. Thanks. If you had to give some advice to somebody who is starting this type of a business today, right? It's a very different landscape. It's you know 2022 December right now, as you and I are speaking. But if somebody were to start an online type of business that that you're in, what advice would you give them? So when I first started off, uh, online businesses were relatively new, and now it's become a lot more common. So one of the things you really have to pay attention to is how your uniqueness comes through or what your differentiator is. So in other words, uh, when someone compares my company to another time management or productivity company, what makes me different, right? And if we're all painted the same thing, then you, there's no way for you to stand out and, and win a lot of business. So now most markets are pretty saturated. There's a lot more options nowadays. Um, and so when you're starting something, you have to be very clear what makes you different and unique. And if you don't know what that is, then it's hard to get business coming in because people will just say, oh, you're all the same, right? Kind of like if we go to the grocery store and we pick our, our toothpaste, if they're all kind of the same, we just go whatever the price is and then we pick the cheapest or you know whichever color uh, is most appealing, right. that's the one I'll pick. But if I go to a restaurant, I want to pick a restaurant that specializes in like Thai food, for example. But if I go to a restaurant that serves Thai food, Mexican food, and German food all at the same time, I go, uh, I don't know how good that food is going to be. I would rather go to the Thai restaurant that focuses specifically on Thai food, right? Especially if it's somebody who grew up in Thailand, you know, has Thai chefs in the back. Like that's the place I want to go to. So you have to be very clear about your unique proposition. So unique selling proposition, as people would say in marketing. And so before you start launching your business, I would just look at your landscape, your industry, and just get really clear on what makes you different and unique. And if you cannot answer that question, don't start your business yet because you'll be slaughtered. So get really clear on what makes you unique and different. And then if you have the answer to that, great. But if you don't, it's okay because it takes a lot of work and thinking and strategy and reiterating and refining and testing it before you figure it out. But if you can figure that out, you will start to notice that business becomes a lot easier because you send out like a sore thumb or as so Seth Godin would say, you're like a purple cow. Like if you walk in the fields and all of a sudden you see a purple cow, you go, oh, that stands out. Like that's one of one. Like if you want a purple cow, that's there's only one here. Right. Whereas everyone else is black and white. So we want to be like a purple cow. Well said. I recently read the book by Peter Thiel, Zero to One. And he talks a lot about that, right? Is that you always want to basically be the one company offering something nobody else is offering. You want to be that unique purple cow, as you say. And you don't want to be a commodity. You don't want to be offering something where there's dozens of other companies offering basically some generic copy of, because of that, at that point, it's all pure competition and and your profits are just going to be whittled away eventually. But I agree with you. It's good to stand out. It's good to have a unique product. And let's, let's shift a little bit to the actual courses and products you offer, Tan. So what, who, who is your ideal, who is your ideal uh, customer? So I actually had no idea when I first started who my ideal customer was. Uh, I thought it would be people like me. So young entrepreneurial. Um, and it wasn't until I launched my courses and I started to actually meet the people who bought the courses when I realized most people work in corporate America or work in the corporate world or uh, let's say in the late 30s, early 40s, early 50s or so, and are pretty uh, ambitious people. They're always open to learning, willing to invest in ongoing education. That is the type of person that we tend to uh, work with. And what do you think, what would you say is the most common productivity lesson that people need to learn or what is the most common mistake people make? So most people, when they first come to us is oftentimes because they lack time in their life. They're overwhelmed. They have so much going on. They're overcommitted. They said yes to way too many different things. And they think that they can finish everything on their to-do list. Like that's the most common thing I see. 
And one of the first things I will tell people is trying to accomplish everything on your to-do list is a losing game. There's just no way you're going to get everything done. So what we need to learn is how to prioritize our to-do list and focus on the things that matter because we're, we only have a limited time available every single day. You and I have the same 24 hours. And even then we have to sleep, eat, take care of our kids, go to work, you know, do all these different things. And then there's some time left that we have to then allocate to, you know, maybe starting a side business, you know, launching our business or growing it or uh, spending more time with the family or whatever matters to you, what your main priority is. Uh, we have to then figure out how to make the most out of that time, right? But we have to be able to prioritize and say, what is more important than other things that are my to-do list? Because, because when everything looks equally important, nothing truly is. So we have to develop the skill of prioritization. And that's the first thing I always tell people is like, that's the first thing we have to develop oftentimes when we work together, especially when you're lacking time in your life. And it could be as simple as, hey, let's identify what your goals are and then look at all the things on your to-do list that align with that. And anything that is not in alignments, let's maybe uh, push those down the priority list a little bit further, right? So for example, if your to-do list says, uh, you know, finalize my taxes, write my book, and then also uh, redo my closet. Now, these three things in itself in a vacuum could sound very important. However, if your goal is to become a published author, there's only really one task on that to-do list that is more important than others, which is the task of writing uh, a chapter for your book or writing for your book, because it's in alignment with what you find most important, which is you know, becoming a published author. Just like if you want to become the greatest you know, dad in the world, if that's the most important thing to you, there are certain things on your to-do list that are more important than other things. And work-related stuff is probably not high on the list at that point, but you know, spending quality time with your kids, taking them to soccer practice or you know, buying certain toys for them, uh, that's probably more important. Right. So we want to be able to identify those things. And so trying to do everything on your to-do list is a losing game. So don't even try it. Make sure you always work on the maybe one, two, three things at most that matter uh, in comparison to what you're trying to accomplish. And 10, what would you say are the three most important habits that people need to develop? Oh, so I would say there's three things. One is prioritization. So that's one thing we got, we got that covered. And then the other thing, uh, and then I consider that a habit because it's something you have to do every single day. You have to be able to reassess at every single moment, because as soon as you get an email coming in, you have to reassess where does this fall in my priority list, right? So it's a really a habit you have to develop. So that's one. The other two I would say is the way you start your day and the way you end your day. So let me clarify this. The way you start your day sets the tone for the rest of the day. So if you start it right, you're going to have a productive day. And I want to give credit to Brian Tracy for this. He's the OG personal development coach. Uh, he wrote a book called Eat That Frog. And that's something I got from him that made such a profound impact on me that I always want to make sure I quote him and give credit to him because he came up with it. And it's just a simple idea that imagine, Gabe, you walk into the office every single morning you know, you're tired, you're lethargic, you, you kind of have a negative outlook on life, you're not sure what you're going to do today. How productive are you going to be that day when you show up to work like that? Probably not so much. However, if you show up to work feeling excited, you have clarity, you know exactly what you need to do today and how you're going to get it done and you're, you're excited to get the work done, you might have the same tools, the same resources, the same skill sets, but if you show up at work with such an attitude, you will be naturally more productive than the person who doesn't show up in such a way. So we can actually <clears throat> control how we show up for work and how we show up for the day every single day. And so uh, one of the things I teach is what I call the rice ritual is just as soon as you wake up, it doesn't matter what time, whether it's five in the morning or one o'clock in the afternoon, I want to make sure you go through a set of routines to get yourself ready for a productive day. So I want one of the things I want you to do is look at your goals for today. So you, you get your mind focused on what matters. But also, I want to make sure you look at your calendar so you feel prepared for what's coming that day, right? And so there's a certain list of things I recommend people do to kind of get themselves ready for today and feel uh, like they have clarity about what's coming up. So that's one thing. Uh, and developing that habit of starting the day right. 
Now, the flip side of that is also a habit that I always recommend uh, people pick up and, te- and something I teach inside of my programs is what I call the shutdown ritual, which is kind of like the opposite. So we have the rise ritual, which is kind of help you get ready for the day. And then we have the shutdown ritual, which helps you kind of wind down and log off for the day. Because like I mentioned earlier, sleep is the biggest force multiplier for productivity. Uh, imagine if you slept an hour or an extra hour and a half a day, like how much more energetic would you feel? you probably feel so so much better and f- so much more energetic and as a result, a lot more happier and a lot more productive as well. And so even if we don't sleep more, but we increase the quality of, of our sleep, we get the same benefits. And the way we can influence that is actually what we do the last 90 minutes of our day. And that's what I like to call a, a shutdown ritual. So the three things I recommend people do is one, is no screens in the last 90 minutes of your day. So no TV, no phone, no tablet, nothing, uh, because light inhibits uh, the the melatonin production in our body. So whenever there's a lot of lights and screens provide this, uh, our body doesn't produce melatonin, which is the hormone we need to fall asleep. So we want to eliminate screens as much as possible and dim the lights at night. Uh, The second thing I always recommend people do is uh, prepare their to-do list for the next day. So they kind of know when they wake up, what they have to do, and they have a sense of clarity about it as well. And uh, and the third thing is journaling or emptying your head as much as possible. Because if you've ever tried to meditate where you just sit still, you've had this experience where your mind just goes 100 miles an hour. And when you try to go to bed earlier, you have the same experience where your mind is just wandering and processing and it makes it very difficult to fall asleep. And so if we can empty our heads as much as possible before we go to bed, and that's what journaling does, uh, it makes it much easier to get uh, better sleep, but also uh, we tend to sleep a little faster or fall asleep faster, which means more sleep for you. So uh, having some sort of shutdown ritual at the end is, uh, is another habit I like to teach people. Amazing. I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a little bit, Tan. How many hours do you sleep a night on average? So I feel best if I sleep seven and a half to eight hours. Uh, That's kind of like my sweet spot. So I go to bed at 1030. I typically wake up around 6, 630 or so. And uh, that's kind of like my sweet spot, especially if it's winter time. It's dark pretty early. Uh, So I like to go to bed around you know, 10, 10, 30 or so. Uh, if it's summertime, I like to stay out a little bit longer. You know, we're both from Europe, so we kind of know like being outside in, in the daytime is always much more fun. Being out at night is much more fun. There's a lot more social activity going on. So usually in the summertime, I go to bed a little bit later, but then I also tend to wake up a little bit later as well. I'm glad you brought that up about the sleep because a lot of people, and you know, sadly, I'm one of these. This is a mistake I make quite often is it's 10, it's 10, 30 to 11. And I think, you know what, maybe I'll stay up for another hour and get this and this and this done. And then it's midnight when I go to bed and same thing, I got to get up early in the morning to get to work. And now I'm starting the day off on the wrong foot. I haven't slept enough. And I find, yeah, that's that's something I, that's a trap I fall into quite often. So another way I like to frame it is if you could invest 90 minutes to get eight hours of productivity, would you take that deal? Yes. I think everybody would, right? Every time I ask that question, people always say yes. Well, so one way to do that is if you invest 90 minutes before you end your day or as you're wrapping up your day before you go to sleep, if you spend 90 minutes, just no screens, right? You have your to-do list ready for the day, your journal, you literally do that for 90 minutes and then go to sleep, you will wake up so much more energized that you're going to be a lot more productive the next day. So you're investing 90 minutes of your time to get eight hours of productivity. Um, and that's a deal everyone will take. And so it's so simple to do, but, uh, I fall in, into that trap every now and then as well and go, oh, yeah, I have so much to do. Let me work. And then I go, oh no, that's something uh, I've done many times, but I always hate myself the day, the day after, because then I wake up groggy. I don't feel so great. My mood might be a little bit off. I might be a little bit, you know, irritant to some other people. And that's not the way I like to show up for people in my company and people in my life. And so, um, I like to invest those 90 minutes as much as I can because I know it's for the better of the future. And so, especially when it comes to wealth creation, uh, which is a big topic of this podcast as well, is we have to, you know, have to have to be able to not have the instant gratification of doing stuff right now, but be able to put things off for the future as well. And this is very similar in that sense. Well said, well said. And again, the website is asianefficiency.com where visitors can find more information on the various programs you have and your 
coaching sessions, mentoring sessions, and your seminars, what are some of the more popular ones that people gravitate to on your website? Yeah, so we have a new course called the 25X Productivity System. So this is our methodology for productivity. So one of the things I've identified from teaching productivity for over a decade now is that all of our most successful clients have 25 skills in common. So we kind of created our own program now to say, hey, if you want to master productivity, there's 25 skills. And there's a roadmap to mastering productivity. And we've essentially now created that roadmap that people can follow. So um, that's one that's really popular right now. We also have a course called uh, Easy Organization System. So if you're disorganized when it comes to your computer and your desktop is like a hot mess and your downloads folder is all over the place and you can never find stuff, uh, this course will help you get uh, decluttered and organized as well. And that's another popular one. Nice, nice. Actually, when I was looking at your website earlier today, I saw that you have one of those courses on organization. I think there's a photo, like a file folder there. Um, and I thought about uh, this book I read recently, and I'm trying to, I think the title was Algorithms to Live By. And it's really interesting. I don't know if you are familiar with the book, and I'll, I'll put this one in the show notes as well. And it's a, it's a mathematician. So it's a mathematics professor who talks about various sorting algorithms and about applying mathematical principles to things like how you should organize your, you know, whether it's a physical file folder or a computer file or something like there's some mathematical theories behind it, uh, which I found quite, quite fascinating. And getting quickly back to your, to your podcast, because I'm fascinated by how successful your pod podcast is and congratulations again, it took you several years to get up to speed when you first started um, AsianEfficiency.com. And I think you mentioned earlier that you started your podcast about five years ago. How quickly did that po podcast ramp? And when did you first start getting like thousands upon thousands of downloads per episode? Yeah, so I had a slight advantage when I launched the podcast. So we launched the podcast in 2016. And so my business started in 2011. So I had five years of building an audience through blogging. Right. So by the time we launched our podcast, I think at that point we had like 30,000 email subscribers, like newsletter subscribers. And so when we launched our podcast is, uh, you know, first of January 1st, like 2016, I remember. And, uh, as everyone knows, when you launch a podcast, you want to get in front of like the, the front page of Apple, right. Apple podcasts or iTunes, as it was called back then, because if you're on the front page, everyone is going to discover you and then you get more eyeballs. And so we knew that, okay, the way to do that is when you launch a podcast, you release a bunch of episodes, and then you drive as many people to go consume that episode. And so we had the advantage at that point because we had an audience already to say, hey, hey guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just launched a new podcast. Go check it out right now and uh, you know, leave us a review and you know, hope you have a great time listening to it. And so that kind of helped us accelerate to the front page of uh, iTunes. And then from there, I kind of like... You have that repeated exposure. And then if you're in the top, you know, 20 or so top 10 for a while, you get that extra exposure. And then uh, I, that was kind of like the initial burst. So for anyone who's listening, if you're launching a podcast, like the launching part is really, really important. Uh, try to nail that as much as possible. But then after that, you still have to show up. You have to create consistent content. We've done a podcast every single week for the last you know, six, you know, six years now. And so uh, I've never missed a beat, you know, done it every single week. And you have to show up every week and create good content. And I always have to innovate as well. And that's something uh, I have to learn, and especially in the last few years. Is if you just say the same thing for six years in a row, you're going to lose people along the way because they're just you're going to sound like an old grandpa that just says the same thing. So you ha always have to innovate as a creator and uh, expand beyond certain topics, like just like how we're talking about productivity today, you know, on, on a wealth creation podcast. Like we have to go on, you know, topics that are somewhat related to it that people are also interested in. And you have to learn what people are interested in because, you know, yes, they come to me for productivity advice, but they're also interested in personal finance. They're also interested in psychology. They're also interested in life extension and life optimization. And there's all these like side tangents topics that personally I'm also interested in. So as I'm exploring and creating new stuff, uh, I want to communicate it back to people who are listening to the podcast as well. And that's how you keep stuff interesting, you know, even five, six years later. So that's something I had to learn. So for anyone who's listening, don't be afraid if you're doing this for a while to expand beyond what you're just, you know, started off with, because 
people are growing on a journey with you. And if you are the journey itself as well, people are excited to be there with you as well. Definitely. Definitely. So yeah, I mean, I'm very, it's early days for me here on this podcast journey. Um, and I'm definitely enjoying it. And you're right. It's it, you definitely have to be ready to consistently, you know, have guests and record content and put out content, et cetera. And, um, it is, it is a lot, you know, it is something that you have to invest a lot of time in over, over a long period. So wish me luck. But I, I think again, your podcast is, is pretty amazing. I think, uh, right now it's, you've had over 12 million downloads historically. And like you, like you mentioned, I think you're on episode 400 something, right? So you've been at this now for five, six years doing it week in, week out. So hats off to you. Uh, Tan, uh, switching gears a little bit, you're an entrepreneur and there are a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to my show. A lot of people in their thirties, like yourself, who are maybe just first start thinking about retirement. I know I was in my thirties when I first started thinking about, okay, what will my finances look like when I'm in my sixties, et cetera? Um, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who don't have, you know, the company 401k and the company 401k match? Etc. How, how do you personally look at retirement, and what kind of financial moves are are you making? So, I uh, one thing I've discovered is there's this rabbit hole can go really deep, and you can go really far and wide. And trying to do it yourself can be very challenging and overwhelming. So, there's actually a great book uh, I recommend called Beyond a Million. It's written by Jim Dew, and the book is all about like how do we uh, help entrepreneurs. Uh, once, especially when they grow, quote unquote, beyond a million, what to do with their money and and how to build wealth. And one of the major concepts I really like from the book, and I was actually able to interview the uh, author of the book as well, Jim Dew. Uh, he said in the book, you want to build your financial dream team. And what he meant with that is you want to sur surround yourself with people who have an expertise in particular areas and that you consult with and work with on an ongoing basis because they're going to be helping you build your wealth, you know, and manage your money uh, with you. So, and that's really what a wealth manager does. But one of the things he said is, you know, for most entrepreneurs, we want to work with a good accountant or CPA so they can help, you know, do our taxes, but also hopefully give us advice on how we can minimize our tax liability, right? So that's one person you want to have on your team is is that person. Another person is, a, is maybe like an insurance expert so that when you need business insurance or you need event insurance or whatever type of insurances you need in your business and in your life, you can get the best rates, but also, you know, uh, how to protect yourself and so on. So that's another person you would want to have. You then you want somebody who does legacy planning, right? So someone who has an expertise in like trusts and wills and um, what happens with the money and assets you have if you pass away for whatever reason, right? Or if you uh, become at a certain stage where you don't, you know, just not mentally sharp anymore. And so there's all these things I have no clue about, but. I, I said, you know, I really like this concept of a financial dream team. Let me just start finding people in those particular areas and surround myself with those kinds of people. And so you want to have like a corporate attorney. So you know how you have legal agreements in place. And, you know, that can be really important for like, you know, uh, saving money on certain taxes and so on. Uh, and also how you structure deals and cash flow and stuff like that. So there's all these intricacies that can, you know, I'm really fascinated myself. Uh, but when I have these ongoing conversations with these people that are surrounding myself, I'm learning from them. Uh, and they have my best interests at heart as well, because, you know, that's how, that's why we have a working relationship. And so it's really difficult to stay on top of all these different things. And so uh, I've kind of learned that again, going back to the who problem is, you know, how can I solve this? Well, I just need to find the right person who already knows how to do these things. So I kind of slowly started building my financial dream team. And I have to get credit to Jim Dew, the author of Beyond a Million. So I highly recommend people go check out that book as well. I'll de I haven't heard of the book before, but I'll definitely add it to my list and I'll put it in the show notes as well. So thanks very much for, for bringing that up. And uh, Tan, what is next for you and your company? Where do you see this company growing over the next five or 10 years? And do you have any personal goals with the company and outside of the company that uh, that you're pursuing? Yeah, right now, uh, we've done everything up to this point online. We've always done online courses and programs. And so the next phase in my company is actually going the opposite direction, which is going offline. So we're offering uh, in-person coaching, in-person workshops, uh, doing it live, uh, have a conference at some point. Uh, we're having an in-person experience. And so I'm go actually going against what we're normally doing. And that's one of the ways we're reinventing our company. 
And so uh, that's something I'm very excited about and what we're working on for the next five to 10 years is just having an offline presence uh, as well. So I'm doing a lot more speaking, coaching in person, teaching workshops. And that's uh, ultimately where I would like my company to be, where it's like you have an online and an offline component to it. So however you come in, there's plenty of options for you to go on your journey and become the most productive person you can be. Do you have any individuals or any other books that you personally look up to or or admire? Ooh, there's a lot of books. Uh, I, t- I t- try to read like 15 to 20 books a year, and I've always had friends who recommend tons of books. Um, as far as like when it comes to money, I think the Beyond a Million book is something I would recommend, especially for entrepreneurs. Uh, even if you're not, you know, you don't have to be quote unquote uh, making a million dollars a year or anything to benefit from this book. There's actually a lot of ideas uh, that benefit anybody who is just starting out because you just want to surround yourself with the right people and just understand risk, which I think is an underrated topic in business and, and wealth, just understanding risk. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Keith Cunningham. He wrote a book, The Road Less Stupid, which is all about how do we improve our financial decision-making in our lives. And uh, that's a, another book I always uh, love to refer back to. Uh, going going from zero to $100 million uh, by Michael Masterson, I think is the, the book. Uh, that's one I always refer back to as well. And then uh, another one is Scaling Up, which is a business uh, operating system. And it's a great book. And it's something we personally use here at uh, AE. I love it. Tan, um, I think just before we wrap up this this interview, again, thanks very much for your time. The website is AsianEfficiency.com. Check it out today. Amazing content on productivity. Um, Tan, thanks very much for your time. And um, yeah, have a great day. Thank you for having me.